All right, we're going on to Hebrews 10. Hopefully you guys are enjoying going through the book of Hebrews. I always found it a very interesting passage and also one that was quite difficult to understand. So hopefully it's helping you get your head around some of these verses in Hebrews 10. All right, let's read Hebrews 10. We're just going to do the one chapter today because we're going to spend a bit more, bit more time here. This is probably one of the more difficult passages for uh, the once saved, always saved position and for people that believe salvation by grace. So I'll... Uh, try and explain to the best of my ability um, the verses in there uh, and I hope you'll see that it's consistent with the rest of the book of Hebrews. All right, Hebrews 10. For the law having a shadow of good things to come and not the very image of the things can never with those sacrifices which they offered year by year continually make the comers there aren't too perfect. For then would they not have ceased to be offered? Because that the worshippers once, once purged should have had no more conscience of sins, but in those sacrifices there is a remembrance again made of sins every year. For it is not possible that the blood of bulls and of goats should take away sins. Wherefore, when he cometh into the world, he saith, Sacrifice and offering thou wouldest not, but a body hast thou prepared me. In burnt offerings and sacrifices for sin thou hast had no pleasure. Then said I, Lo, I come, in the volume of the book it is written of me, to, to do thy will, O God. Above, when he said, Sacrifice and offering and burnt offerings and offering for sin, thou wouldest not, neither hadst pleasure therein, which are offered by the law. Then said he, Lo, I come to do thy will, O God. He taketh away the first, that he may establish the second. By the which will we are sanctified through the offering of the body of Jesus Christ once for all. And every priest standeth daily ministering and offering oftentimes the same sacrifices which can never take away sins. But this man, after he had offered one sacrifice for sins forever, sat down on the right hand of God, from henceforth expecting till his enemies be made his footstool. For by one offering he hath perfected forever them that are sanctified. Whereof the Holy Ghost also is a witness to us, for after that he had said before, this is the covenant that I will make with them after those days, saith the Lord. I will put my laws into their hearts, and in their minds will I write them, and their sins and iniquities will I remember no more. Now where remission of these is, there is no more offering for sin. Having therefore, brethren, boldness to enter into the holiest by the blood of Jesus, by a new and living way which he hath consecrated for us through the veil, that is to say, his flesh, and having a high priest over the house of God, let us draw near with a true heart in full assurance of faith, having our hearts sprinkled from an evil conscience and our bodies washed with pure water. Let us hold fast the profession of our faith without wavering, for he is faithful that promised. And let us consider one another to provoke unto love and to good works, not forsaking the assembling of ourselves together as the manner of some is, but exhorting one another, and so much the more, as you see the day approaching. For if we sin willfully, after that we have received the knowledge of the truth, there remaineth no more sacrifice for sins, but a certain, fearful, looking for of judgment and fiery indignation which shall devour the adversaries. He that despised Moses' law died without mercy under two or three witnesses, two or three witnesses of how much sore a punishment suppose ye, shall he be thought worthy, who hath trodden underfoot the Son of God, and hath counted the blood of the covenant wherewith he was sanctified an unholy thing, and hath done despite unto the Spirit of grace. For we know him that hath said, Vengeance belongeth unto me, I will recompense, saith the Lord, and again the Lord shall judge his people. It is a fearful thing to fall into the hands of the living God. But call to remembrance the former days, in which after you were illuminated, ye endured a great fight of afflictions, partly whilst you were made a gazing stock, both by reproaches and afflictions, and partly whilst ye became companions of them that were so used. For ye had compassion of me and my bonds, and took joyfully the spoiling of your goods, knowing in yourselves that ye have in heaven a better and enduring substance. Cast not away therefore your confidence, which hath great recompense of reward. For ye have need of patience, 
that after you've done the will of God, you might receive the promise. For yet a little while, and he that shall come will come and will not tarry. Now the just shall live by faith, but if any man draw back, my soul shall have no pleasure in him. But we are not of them who draw back unto perdition, but of them that believe to the saving of the soul. Hebrews 10. All right, so let's go through it verse by verse, and hopefully uh, I'll, try and, I'll try and explain it to the best of my ability. But really there are two main, th this is a really a main passage in Hebrews, because if you've ever had to talk to somebody about <coughs> salvation by grace, or you know, the fact that once we're saved we have eternal life, you know, we have present tense eternal life, uh, people often go to Hebrews 10 to try and show, especially when you saw, I think it was verse 29 off the top of my head, if we sin willfully, and it talks about a judgment. They'll say, see, if you, if you continue in sin, grace is not going to abound, right? <laughs> Which is basically what they're saying. Even though Romans said, shall we continue in sin, that grace may abound. They believe that, well, if you continue in sin, grace is not going to continue to abound. There's going to be a certain fearful looking for of judgment. So we need to understand how we, we, we need to know how to understand that in light of what Hebrews is teaching and in light of salvation by grace and having eternal life. Now, there are really two explanations for Hebrews 10 from this point of view. One is that Hebrews is talking to truly saved people, which is not my view, and we've sort of talked about that in previous weeks that Hebrews is talking to truly saved people and the fiery judgment and indignation and if you sin willfully is basically the chastisement of God. You know, that's one way to look at it where if you continue in sin as a believer, there is a loving chastisement of God that will come down on you and that's what's being described in Hebrews 10. Now that's not my view. You know, I used to hold that view, but you know, I'll go through why I don't hold that view anymore. My view is that, uh, you know, Hebrews is obviously written to people professing Jesus Christ. So there are warnings in there to make sure that these Hebrew professing Christians actually do believe. And that's what he's warning of here. And that the sinning willfully is actually talking about the sin of unbelief. And then therefore it follows that if you do not enter into the holies, you do not enter into the rest, you do not accept, you do not actually believe the profession that you're making, then there will be no more sacrifice for sins and there will be a judgment that you're looking for and that is hell, which makes sense if it's a fiery judgment. But I'll go into it as we go into those verses. All right, so let's start at verse 1, Hebrews 10. For the law, so now we're talking about, you know, the, the commandments and the ability to, tr you know, attempt but what we're learning in Hebrews is you cannot get rid of those sins from the shadow of the heavenly things because they were just there to point towards Jesus. For the law, having a shadow of good things to come. So if you remember in chapter 9, there was the comparison between the heavenly tabernacle and the earthly tabernacle. So now he's just reiterating that point. The law had a shadow of things to come. But that tabernacle, that, earth, that worldly sanctuary was not the very image of the things. And because it wasn't the actual things, the, the real things that they represented, therefore the shadow of things and the sacrifices can never, with those sacrifices which they offered year by year, continually make the comers thereunto perfect. So does that make sense? He's saying, hey, it's a shadow. So that's why it didn't matter if every year they did these animal sacrifices, it didn't actually make them perfect. Now, what is this perfect referring to? Is it referring to saying, well, when they, when they, sacrifice, you know, when they did that sacrifice, that they became sinless? I don't think this is what this is referring to in Hebrews, and I'll explain why, and I think it's consistent even in Hebrews 10. But if we continue, if we look at this in Hebrews 9, and I mentioned this last week when I went through Hebrews 9 to take note of this. It says here, this was a figure. What was the figure? was the earthly tabernacle and the earthly sacrifice, animal sacrifices, which was a figure for the time then present in which were offered both gifts and sacrifices. Look at this. That could not make him that did the service perfect as pertaining to the conscience. Right? So what is that referring to when it talks about in Hebrews 10 now being made perfect? I think it's referring to this concept here that according to the conscience you're made perfect. And 
Let me try and explain what I think that means in Hebrews 10. And you'll see that here. It's, it's obviously not that at that point you become sinless because it's not until you believe and you're born again that sinless new creature is born of God. You have the blood of Christ you know, interceding for you and the high priest interceding for you. And then at the resurrection, when you're given your new body, that's when you actually become sinlessly perfect. So what does it mean prior to salvation? Because prior to, you know, the, the picture being drawn here is when you enter into the holiest of all by faith, that's when you actually get saved. So what's the picture being drawn here that when the sacrifice is made, that they can be made perfect according to the conscience in order to enter into the holiest of all? So what I believe it's talking about here as pertaining to the conscience, it's like the guilt that you have sinned against God and being, having, being, having that guilt being able to be taken away by a valid sacrifice. So it's like saying, hey, there was a shadow of good things to come and because the shadow was just sacrificing animals, when the people sacrificed those animals, it's like in the conscience they knew that sacrificing this bull or sacrificing this dove or this lamb cannot atone for my sins. This is not going to get rid of it. And I'm doing it every year knowing that this doesn't get rid of it. Because if it got rid of them, I wouldn't have to keep doing these sacrifices. But where Jesus' sacrifice makes your conscience perfect according to sin, it's like there's something in your conscience that tells you, hey, this sacrifice of Jesus Christ is sufficient in order to cleanse me of the guilt of sin. And this is what I think you see in Hebrews 10. So it's not that it's perfect, meaning that you sacri you know, just because Jesus is sacrificed for people, that people are automatically made sinners. Why? Because Jesus died for people that don't believe. Right? So just because Jesus died, that doesn't mean that everybody just becomes sinlessly perfect. But everybody in the conscience, right, just like we have the law of God in our conscience, knowing that God Himself came to be your sacrifice. As pertaining to the conscience, it's like your conscience innately recognizes that that is a suitable sacrifice in order to get rid of your, all your sins. Whereas when an animal is sacrificed, it doesn't make you perfect as pertaining to the conscience, because in the conscience you know this animal cannot atone for my sins. And this is what we see here as we read on in Hebrews 10. For then would they not have ceased... You've got to be careful how you read this, because in, in Hebrews 2, uh, Hebrews 10, 2, it's a question. It's not a statement, right? So if you're reading through Hebrews 10, right, you say, Lord, make promise unto that, and, and you read, for then would they not have ceased to be offered? So if you read it that way, for then would they not have ceased to be offered, then you're saying, then you, then you're saying that the, the sacrifices did cease. Does that make sense? For then would they not have ceased to be offered? But it's a question. For then... Would they not have ceased to be offered? So what he's saying there is, if it could make the comers, uh, the people that came to do the sacrifices perfect as pertaining to the conscience, why didn't they stop? That's what he's saying. Why would those sacrifices not cease to be offered? Does that make sense? Because he's saying, hey, if, if an animal could purge your conscience of sins and make, you know, take away that guilt, had the ability to take away that guilt, then only one animal sacrifice would have been necessary. But the fact that you had year by year, you had to come, sacrifice those animals, you knew it couldn't make your conscience perfect according to sin. He says, because that the worshippers, so, so now we, we, we're talking about two groups here in the first part of Hebrews 10. First, there's the people that come to offer a sacrifice in order to have their sins forgiven. And then later on, we, we talk about the priests actually doing the sacrifice for them. So we see the two groups here, the two pictures. So you, as a, a, the picture in the Old Testament is you have to be, you know, sanctified and washed in order to come to worship God. But the priests also had to be sanctified and washed in order to enter into the holiest. And we'll see how that lines up with salvation in a moment. The worshippers, so these are the people of Israel coming to the temple, once purged, should have had no more conscience of sins. So you see how it's very consistent there that they're not made perfect as pertaining to the conscience. They couldn't make the comers continually, make the comers thereunto perfect 
Verse 2, he says, because that the worshippers, if they were purged once from those animal sacrifices, they should have had no more conscience of sins. Not the fact that they, they didn't have sins anymore. It's not until you are, believe, enter into the presence of God, that you are born again and you have the sinless new man. But in those sacrifices, there is a remembrance again made of sins every year. So as the difference between, you know, recognizing Jesus Christ can take away sins, the, what the animal sacrifices accomplished was it just reminded them that they had these sins that they couldn't get away with these animal sacrifices. You see? There's a remembrance again made of sins every year. Why? For well, it is not possible that the blood of bulls and goats should take away sin. See, so the conscience recognized, when this animal dies to me, it's not possible that it's dying in my place. But the conscience recognizes what when Jesus dies in my place, that is possible to take away my guilt and make me perfect as pertaining to the conscience. Wherefore, when he cometh into the world, now he's going to quote a psalm. Right? He's going to quote a psalm here, which is prophetical about Jesus Christ coming because God ultimately is not satisfied, his wrath is not satisfied by animals atoning for sin and it's a it's a prophecy of jesus christ coming instead of these animal sacrifices wherefore when he cometh into the world so what is that referring to when he's born right when you come into the world uh, just like it says in john 1 it, he, he's that true light that lighteth every man which cometh into the world right so that's when men are we're all born uh, we all experience that light of jesus christ in one way or another he saith, Sac so now this is the quote, sacrifice and offering thou wouldest not. So you just got to remember here, like we use wood today more like should in, in, in our vocabulary. But when the Bible sometimes uses the word would, it's, it's, it's like your desire, your will, your want. When you would do something, like we would kind of say like that's something I'm going to do as opposed to something I want to do. So he says, sacrifice and offering thou wouldest not. So he's saying like that you don't desire that. You don't will for those but a body hast thou prepared me so that's the prophecy of jesus christ's body being the true sacrifice as opposed to the animal sacrifices all right so he's saying hey you're not you're not sac you're not satisfied you don't want or desire the animal sacrifices but the sacrifice that is going to atone for sin is going to be the body of jesus christ in burnt offerings and sacrifices for sin thou hast had no pleasure. So this is just continuing the quote from Psalm 40. Then said I, lo. Uh, if you're wondering what lo means, lo is just a short form of, the, of look. Right? So when the Bible says lo and behold, it just means look and behold. Then said I, lo, I come. In the volume of the book it is written of me to do thy will. Oh God. So that's a prophecy of Jesus coming to fulfill God's will to be that sacrifice for our sins. All right? And it's the will of God that whosoever sees the Son and believes on him shall have everlasting life. So in the volume of the book it is written of me, who Jesus Christ, to do thy will, O oh God. So this is a quote from Psalm 40. Sacrifice and offering thou didst not desire. So you see here, thou wouldest not is what God desires. Thou didst not desire. Mine ears hast thou opened. Now just underline that because I want you to compare that with Hebrews. And I just think it's interesting how that is translated in Hebrews as a body that thou, thou hast prepared for me. Mine ears hast thou opened. Burnt offerings and sin offering hast thou not required. Then said I, lo, I come in the volume of the book it is written of me. I delight to do thy will, O my God, Yea, thy law is within my heart. So this is interesting because if, I guess if you're going to read Psalm 40, you would think that mine ears hast thou opened is referring to the fact that, you know, it's like you have ears, but you're, you're, just, a, you're just being allowed to hear something, if that makes sense. So, you know, when you say like, op when we say like, oh, open my heart, or we say open my mind, open my ears, you're kind of saying, allow me to hear or understand what is being said to me. What's interesting about this being quoted in Hebrews as, but a body hast thou prepared me, that it makes us understand that this phrase here 
he's actually referring to his, his physical ears actually being created, right? So it's like the, the tongue being created in the body, the ears being open, if you think like, a, if you say like a flower being created and things like that. That's the only way I can link those two together. I've read some things about it. Some people say because this is like, a, like a, some sort of idiom in the Hebrew language, I'm not too sure, but then they say, you know, how it's translated into English, it makes sense, but it can also be translated the fact that his, it's referring to the fact that he has a physical body being created. Like the ears actually being opened is like the tongue being created or the mouth being created, things like that. So mine ears has thou opened is translated in the New Testament and quoted by Paul as but a body hast thou prepared me. So it's somehow referring, this must somehow be referring to the physical body of Jesus Christ that is coming, that is born into the world. Let's continue. Hebrews 10 8. Above, so he's now referring to that quote of Psalms that he just quoted, Psalm 40. It says, Above, when he said, Sacrifice and offerings and burnt offerings and offering for sin thou wouldest not, neither hadst pleasure therein which are offered by the law. So now, if you're wondering why, how, like, I, I understand that Psalms 40, that quote, well, it's because in Hebrews 10, Paul then actually goes on to explain Psalm 40. So he says, hey, above, when he's saying he didn't want the offerings and burnt sacrifices, he's talking about those animal sacrifices that were made in the law of Moses. Then said he, so he says, now that he says that's not what he wants, what he wants is the true sacrifice of the body of Jesus. Lo, I come to do thy will, O God. He taketh away the first that he may establish the second. So he's saying, hey, this passage in Psalms is actually an allusion to the old covenant being replaced by the new covenant. The old works of the law and the sacrifices being replaced by Jesus Christ and coming and being the true sacrifices. He taketh away the first that he may establish the second. Talking about the covenants. By the which will, so he's saying by that, that will of God that came, you know, that, the will of God that made Jesus come and die on the cross and, and be that body sacrifice, says, hey, by the which will, we are sanctified through the offering of the body of Jesus Christ once for all. So you see there, again, the comparison between those animal sacrifices, Jesus coming to do the will of God as the man Christ Jesus being that true quote unquote animal sacrifice because he is the very image of what those things were a shadow of. So that's the first picture in Hebrews 10. The first picture is the worshippers coming, being made perfect as pertaining to the conscience. Now he goes on to the second group which is the priests actually within the sanctuary doing those offerings. So he says in the same way every priest stands daily, standeth daily ministering and offering oftentimes. So you see, because I mean every day, because the comers are coming maybe year by year, once a year to offer their sacrifice. But the, the, the priests in the temple every day are doing sacrifices, right? Continually. And every priest, priest standing daily ministering and offering oftentimes, many times, the same sacrifices which can never take away sins. So again, you see there that there's that remembrance of sins from the people, not only to the people, but the priests realize, man, I am sacrificing animals every day. Surely this cannot take away sins, right? But this man, who? Jesus Christ. After he had offered one sacrifice for sins forever, what? His own body, right? Sat down on the right hand of God, from henceforth expecting till his enemies be made his footstool. For by one offering... He hath perfected forever them that are sanctified. So Ashton and I have talked about this verse. And that's why in context of what I just explained with Hebrews 9 and being perfect according to the conscience, you can see how this verse makes sense now where it's saying, hey, that one offering, not the continual offering that couldn't make people perfect as pertaining to the conscience, this one offering by Jesus Christ can perfect people as pertaining to the conscience in the sense that your conscience understands and realizes that it can be made guiltless by this sacrifice forever them that are sanctified right because when jesus christ dies he sanctifies in the sense that he sanctifies your conscience so that you understand hey i can be saved 
forever by this sacrifice, by believing and entering in. Now, I'll come back to that. So, for where, so whereof, we'll just go down to verse 17, where again, I'll just show you that this perfected as pertaining to the conscious, is, it goes all the way through to verse 17. Forever that them that are sanctified. Whereof the Holy Ghost also is a witness to us. So he's saying, hey, not only is there this one offering that can take away all sins and can make you perfect as pertaining to the conscience, he says here, the Holy Ghost also testifies of this, and then he quotes this Old Testament uh, when, it, when, when we read, uh, I believe it was Hebrews 8, where he was quoting from Jeremiah, right? Jeremiah 30-something. This is the covenant that I will make with them after those days, saith the Lord. I will put my laws into their hearts, and in their minds will I write them, and their sins and iniquities will I remember no more. So if you remember when the animal sacrifices, hey, there's a remembrance of sins every year. Because if, if God's commanding them, to come every year to atone for their sins and that's like saying hey god is reminding you that you have sins every year but the fact that jesus christ once died to make us perfect according to the conscience he's saying hey this passage in jeremiah is the holy ghost testifying to that because when god says hey you know i'm going to make this new covenant with them jesus christ is the mediator mediator of that new covenant he's the sacrifice for that new covenant then he says, hey, their sins and their iniquities I will remember no more. So as opposed to God remembering their sins once every year as they come and sacrifice those burnt offerings, the difference with Jesus is he's saying, hey, this sacrifice will allow me to not remember them at all forever, right? Because the one sacrifice was Jesus, from Jesus was enough. Now this is where I think people get stuck, is verse 14. Right? We already talked about a bit what it means to be perfected. But I want to just talk a bit about sanctified and uh, dispel, I think, some wrong ideas and what it means to be sanctified or give us a better understanding of the different aspects of what it means to be sanctified. Because generally when we hear this term sanctified, and this is why some people believe that Hebrews can only apply to saved people, because if it's talking about sanctified individuals, isn't that only saved believers? Aren't only saved believers sanctified? Well, I don't think that is the case. I don't think just because something is sanctified necessarily means that it's saved. And I think we get this idea because we think of justification, right? We say, well, justification is when you get saved, and sanctification applies to justified people because sanctification is now about you living right. Now, I don't deny that that is one meaning of sanctification, right? So there is an idea in the Bible that there is sanctification as me as a saved believer being used as a vessel of God in God's, you know, army or in God's, you know, uh, you know uh, work, being purged and being sanctified so that I can be used by God in his work. And this is what we see in 2 Timothy 2. Nevertheless, the foundation of God standeth sure, having this seal, the Lord knoweth them that are his, and let everyone that nameth the name of Christ depart from iniquity. So this is an exhortation for us as everyone who names the name of Christ. If you call yourself a Christian, hey, you ought to attempt to sanctify yourself in the sense that you set yourself apart from sin. But in a great house, there are not only vessels of gold and of silver, but also of wood and of earth, and some to honor and some to dishonor. If a, if a man therefore purge himself from these, from what? From sin, he shall be a vessel unto honor, sanctified and meet for the master's use and prepared unto every good work. So, yeah, I'm not denying the fact that sanctified can be applied to believers. But there is also a sanctification that takes place to all people to prepare them to be able to be saved, right? And I just want to show you that the word sanctification doesn't only apply to believers. You, we see, I'll give you two examples in the Bible where we can see that it is used just to mean, because what does the word sanctify mean? Sanctify means just to be set apart, right? So when it comes to salvation, everybody has the ability to be saved. So everyone, every, all the blood of Jesus Christ applies to everybody because Jesus Christ died for everybody, but it's not going to profit you unless you mix it with faith, right? Just like entering into the promised land. 
God allowed all of them, extended grace to them to allow them to enter into the promised land. But unless they believe, right, then it's going to do them no good, right? Because it's not actually going to intercede for them on the, on the mercy seat. So there's that sanctification from a believer's point of view to be a vessel meet for the master's use. But look here. This is talking about Jeremiah being sanctified as a prophet. Before I formed thee in the belly, I knew thee. And before thou camest forth out of the womb, look at this, I sanctified thee and ordained thee a prophet unto the nation. So if sanctified only refers to people that are saved, then how is Jeremiah as a prophet sanctified before he even exists? No, because it doesn't, it, there's, there's, you know, it's like repentance, right? Repentance is something that happens, but you, there's a repentance that believers do, there's a repentance that unbelievers do in order to get saved. It's the same with sanctification, right? There's a sanctification that happens in the believer's life, but there's also a sanctification that happens in the unbeliever's life that allows them to become a believer, right? And that is the making them perfect according to the conscience so that they're able to enter into the holiest by faith. I ordain thee a prophet unto the nations. Look, here's another passage that shows somebody can be sanctified and they're not necessarily a saved person. For the unbelieving husband is sanctified by the wife and the unbelieving wife is sanctified by the husband. So this proves that these are unsaved people being sanctified in some way. So don't get me wrong, this, this is where people get mixed up. Sanctification doesn't always only mean one thing. The word sanctify means to set apart, but what are you being set apart from? Right? What, well, how are you being sanctified? In what way and in what application depends on the context of what's being talked about. So here it's talking about sanctifying the marriage. Right? So even though you marry an unbeliever, your children are not illegitimate. Right? Your children are not bastards. Right? Your children are still legitimate because if there's a believing wife, um, that sanctifies. That's what I believe 1 Corinthians 7 is talking about. You know, Jeremiah is talking about him being set apart in order to be a preacher for God. You know, nothing to do with his salvation, but he's sanctified, he's set apart. So we can be set apart as an unbeliever in order to be saved. And as a saved person, we can be set apart from sin in order to be used by God. Now let me show you here, because we'll go to, if you remember in Hebrews 10, there were the two different groups, right? There were the worshippers and then there were the priests. And I want to show you here that even in the Old Testament shadow, sanctification always happened prior to the keeping of the covenant. Right? So just like, so what I believe Hebrews 10 is painting this picture here is you're sanctified as an unbeliever for salvation and then you keep the covenant by believing on Jesus Christ and allowing you to enter into the holiest of all by faith, holding fast that profession by faith. Now the picture in the Old Testament is the people were sanctified in order to approach the mountain, right? But then the covenant they had to keep was a covenant by works, and that's why, you know, they had to beware to touch the mountain. There was a fear there, and they ultimately couldn't keep, the co they couldn't keep that covenant, right? I want to show you here that prior to the establishing of the covenant and the attempt to keep the covenant, there is a washing and there is a sanctifying taking place. Likewise, the priests, which is the other picture, before they could enter into the holiest of all, which is the picture of salvation that's being painted, there is also a sanctifying process and a washing process that takes place prior to them going into the holiest of all. So that is that picture in the Old Testament, that the sanct there's a sanctifying and a washing that happens prior to to approaching the mountain prior to entering into the holiest of all. And likewise, those who are a shadow of the real things, the image of the true things, there is, a, there is a spiritual sanctifying and a washing that is taking place in order to allow us to enter into the holiest of all by faith. Here's Exodus 19. So this is the, where the people are sanctified and washed. And the Lord said unto Moses, Go unto the people sanctify them today and tomorrow and let them wash their clothes. Now, if you're familiar with Exodus 9, Exodus, you'll know that Exodus 20 is very important. Why? Because that's the Ten Commandments. That's when they actually met God on the mountain and God descended in fire 
and you know people that believe they found the true Mount Sinai. I don't know if you've ever seen those documentaries, but if you look on YouTube, like finding the real Mount Sinai, it's quite interesting. I mean, I don't know if it's the real Mount Sinai, but it's pretty cool the things that they find on this mountain that they took pictures of because they, they go into the, uh, I don't know what peninsula it is, but they, they look at all these mountains and all the mount there's all these mountains there, but they think Mount Sinai is this one mountain that's different. Why? Because the top of this mountain is actually all charred. It's all black. And they went and saw the rocks and they can see that there's like soot around the rocks from, from fire. But that mountain is the only mountain that's like that. All the other mountains don't have this charred top. So that sort of makes sense. If God descended with fire, that there would be one mountain that has a black top. Uh, not only that, but they, they found as well this huge rock, like this humongous rock. And literally, like this rock that they took a picture of is just split right down the middle. And when they look at the split right down the middle, there's like water, um, what's the word? Corrosion. You know, like when water runs over rocks, it kind of makes it smooth. So there's this huge rock they took a picture of. And there's this big split down the middle. And on either side of the split, there's like water corrosion. And the rocks like in front of it, there's all like water corrosion on it. So they're thinking that might have been the rock that Moses struck and was meant to speak to the second time. And he struck the second time and water flowed out from the rock. I mean, I don't know if it's all legit or not, but interesting nonetheless. Go look it up on YouTube. Uh, Ron Wyatt is the guy. Ron Wyatt was like a uh, Christian archaeologist who wanted to find a lot of these old landmarks because a lot of these landmarks are like government controlled and like you, you, they had to like sneak in and stuff like that. So he's, tr he's tried to find the Ark of the Covenant. Don't know if he found that. He thinks he found Mount Sinai. He also thinks he found Noah's Ark, right? Because there's this boat shaped structure that's in this mountain. I don't know if you've seen it and they've done sort of surveys on it and they think there's a cavity. There's big like anchor stones just around the place. So they're thinking, hey, this possibly was Noah's Ark, you know? The last thing he found as well is they think that they found the original site of Sodom and Gomorrah. And the reason why they think it was Sodom and Gomorrah because there was this buried city, but in the walls of the city were like literally balls of sulfur. You know, so that, that could have been the raining of fire and brimstone down onto, onto Sodom and Gomorrah. But go look it up. It's quite interesting. Uh, I, got a bit, I got a bit off track there. What was I talking about? These guys, oh yeah, so they are sanctified. So, oh yeah, that's right. Uh, uh, Ten Commandments. So Exodus 19 is, is the passage before the Ten Commandments. So remember, before coming and making the covenant with the people, with the, the laws, and saying, hey, all the things that God said that we, will, we will do. Moses is saying, hey, sanctify yourself and wash yourself before you come. So you see how it, it happens before they approach God. And be ready against the third day, for the third day the Lord will come down in the sight of all the people. You know, it's, that's probably a prophecy of Jesus Christ raising again the third day, right? Being the mediator of the new covenant. You know, is it any coincidence that on the third day they're going to make a covenant with God and on the third day Jesus rises again establishing the new covenant? Down in the sight of all the people. Upon Mount Sinai. And thou shalt set bounds unto the people round about, saying, Take heed to yourselves that ye go not up into the mount or touch the border of it, whosoever toucheth the mount shall be surely put to death. It's interesting when you read Exodus 19 that he, he tells them to put this bound. He calls up Moses and then God tells Moses to go back down just in case somebody actually breaks through these bounds and tries to approach the mountain and is killed. So it just goes to show that you know, even though they made this covenant, they couldn't approach the mountain of God because it was just a shadow of things to come. They couldn't actually be perfect by that covenant. So they set this border around the mountain saying, take heed to yourselves that you go not up into the mountain, touch the border of it. Whosoever toucheth the mount shall be surely put to death. So again, if they could somehow be sanctified and washed and then be perfect by that covenant, they should be able to approach the mountain. But it just goes to show that they, they couldn't keep the covenant. That's why they couldn't approach that mountain. Right? There was a picture that if they tried to approach, if they tried to come into the presence of God with sin, they would die. There shall not a hand touch it, but he shall surely be stoned or shot through. What is that? They, they fire an arrow at the person. Whether it be beast or man shall not live. When the trumpet soundeth long, they shall come up to the mount. So there was some picture there where they, you know, I believe Moses was able to come up into the mount later. 
I believe that's what that's referring to. Now, we will look at this story a bit later because this story again is alluded to in Hebrews 12, which we'll look at next week. And Moses went down from the mount unto the people and sanctified the people and they washed their clothes. Now, what about the priests, which is the other washing and the sanctifying? You'll see here that before the priests could enter into the holiest of all, there was also a sanctifying and a washing that had to take place. Moses said unto the congregation, this is the thing which the Lord commanded to be done. And Moses brought Aaron and his sons, look at this, and washed them with water. Because we'll see here later, this being alluded to in Hebrews 10, this sanctifying, this washing. So just like the priests, we're the priests in the New Testament, remember? The priesthood of the believer. We're a chosen generation, chosen generation, a royal priesthood, you know, a peculiar people. So when we believe on Jesus Christ, we are the priests under the high priest in the New Testament. Right? So us being able to enter in to the Holy Spirit was before only the high priest could enter in once every year. But here, Moses, Aaron is sanctified. He's washed with water. That's their bodies washed with water. They put on their stuff. We skip down to verse 30. Moses took of the anointing oil and of the blood, which was upon the altar, and sprinkled it upon Aaron and upon his garments and upon his sons and upon his sons' garments with him, and sanctified Aaron and his garments and his sons and his sons' garments with him. So notice here that the sanctifying of the priest prior to entering into the holiest of all is done by what? By blood. Sanctifying them by sprinkling the blood on them and sprinkling their garments. And we see here that's what's alluded to in Hebrews 10. Now let's continue. That's what it's talking about. No more offering for sin being perfect as pertaining to the conscience. Perfect, made them perfect that are sanctified. What is that talking about? That's talking about perfected as pertaining to the conscience forever them that are sanctified in the sense that everyone, because everyone, right, is sanctified by this blood. Now, let's go on. Uh, where did I go to? Let's go back to Hebrews 10 now. 18. Now, where remission of these is, there is no more offering for sin. So he's saying the fact that Christ's offering gets rid, can get rid of all sin as pertaining to the conscience, that's why there's not another sacrifice that needed to be made. Again, when we read before in previous Hebrews chapters, saying he's once offered, right? Otherwise he would have had to suffer many times since the foundation of the world. So what he's saying here to the Hebrews is, this is the one and only offering that is able to save you. Right? There's no other offering for sin. Now here's now where he applies that sanctifying and washing and entering into the holiest of all to salvation. He says, Having therefore, brethren, boldness to enter into the holiest by the blood of Jesus. Now notice here, it's like you can enter boldly. Why? Is it because you're so good? No, it's because now you have a high priest. Now you have the, the, what is necessary for you to be able to enter into the holiest of all. By a new and living way which he hath consecrated for us through the veil that is to say his flesh. Isn't it interesting that the veil in the temple was actually a picture of Jesus Christ. Just like the veil veiled the glory of God to be able to go in. The, the flesh of Jesus Christ veiled the glory of God so that we could see. And having a high priest over the house of God. So you see there that we can, we have the offering, we have the blood, you know, that we are sanctified, the Spirit washes us, therefore we can enter boldly into the holiest of all in order to obtain that salvation that has been prepared for us by faith. That is alluded to when we looked at Hebrews 4, that same entering in boldly. Right? Seeing then that we have a great high priest. Remember, having a high priest over the house of God? Now we're at Hebrews 4. Seeing then that we have a great high priest that is passed into the heavens, Jesus the Son of God, let us hold fast our profession. If you remember in Hebrews 3 and 4, he was laying that principle of repentance from dead works and of faith toward God. So that holding fast, entering into the holiest of all, 
is the holding fast of your profession, you can do that boldly. Why? Because you have the offering and you have the high priest. For we have not a high priest which cannot be touched with the feelings of our infirmities, but is all points tempted like as we are yet without sin. The fact that we have a sinless offering. Let us therefore come boldly unto the throne of grace that we have may, may obtain mercy and find grace to help in time of need. So that's what he's referring to in Hebrews 10 when it says, hey, we have boldness to enter into the holiest by the blood of Jesus Christ. It's not because you're righteous, it's because it, it, Christ has allowed you in order for you to boldly say, you know, oh, I can be saved, I can believe. And you know, it's funny when, when we think about being boldly saved. This is what Jesus allows us to do. Jesus allows us to say, I know I am saved. Why? Because we can have that boldness to enter into the holiest of all. Have you ever had people tell you when you, te when you tell them, you know, I know that I'm saved, they're like, well, that's a, that's a bit bold. That's a bit bold for you to know that you're saved. And the reason is because they think salvation is by their own good works. Yeah, you can't have boldness if you're trying to enter in to the holiest of all by your own works. What's going to happen? You're going to die in the presence of God if you try with your own dead works to enter into the holiest of all. But if you have faith toward God, you have faith in what Jesus has done, in His blood sanctifying you, in the Spirit washing you, allowing you to enter into that holiest of all, you can boldly enter into the throne of God and find grace to help in time of need. Find that salvation. So this is what he's alluding to now in Hebrews 10 when he says in verse 22, let us draw near. Draw near to what? Draw near to God's presence in the holiest of all. So that is the picture of salvation. When you draw near to God, when you enter into the rest, when you enter into the holiest of all, with a true heart in full assurance of faith. So you see, there's the salvation by grace through faith when you enter into the holiest. But why are you able to do that? Because having our hearts sprinkled from an evil conscience. So isn't that very consistent with making the worshippers perfect that are coming to God as pertaining to the conscience? He's perfected forever them that are sanctified so that they are able to draw near with boldness. But notice that it happens prior. Right? So in the spiritual realm, this is happening prior to somebody entering into the holiest of all with a true heart and full assurance of faith. So that's what you want to do. But having, right, you're already, this has already happened to you, your heart sprinkled from an evil conscience, that's the blood, right? That's referring to the blood of Jesus Christ. And our bodies washed with pure water. So you see there that he's drawing that analogy of the priests, now applying it to us, that we need to be sprinkled. We need to be sanctified like Aaron's son. We need to be washed, right? So that we and then have the righteousness of Christ so that we can then enter boldly and find grace to help in time of need and get that, in, that true imputed righteousness into the new man, which is born again once we enter in by faith. Let us hold fast the profession of our faith without wavering. So again, you see that comparing it to Hebrews 4. We hold fast our profession, enter boldly. He's saying, hey, having your heart sprinkled, your body washed, you can enter boldly and hold fast that profession without wavering. Now, is this referring to our, because our faith can waver, right? So is he saying like, well, if you have a, a, a wavering faith, then maybe you're not saved? Because no, we go up and down in our doubts, right? So it's not saying faith without wavering as in your strength or your, the strength of your faith to believe. He's saying you can believe without doubt, not because you're so good. Why? Because he is faithful, that, that promise. So you see, so it's my faith, yeah, my faith, sometimes wavers but he's saying hey you can have your faith not wavering because jesus christ died for you, you know he's faithful that promised he's promised eternal life if you believe on him now this is another thought now so yes he wants them to be saved but also he's exhorting them to do good works so he's not saying you have to do good works in order to enter in because then otherwise you wouldn't be finding grace to help in, in time of need you're earning that that grace so he's just saying here that's the salvation that you can be sure of and we also want you to do good works 
because just because we believe salvation by grace that doesn't mean we don't also believe believers that are saved by grace and once saved always saved ought to do good works so he's also encouraging these people hey i not only want you to be saved i not only want to make sure that you're saved tell you that if you believe this you are saved but also i want you to do good works there's also some practical application in the book of hebrews let us consider one another to provoke unto love and to good works not forsaking the assembling of ourselves together as the manner of some is but exhorting one another and so much the more as you see the day approaching so you see there we ought to consider one another you don't just come to church thinking about yourself you know people come to church and they just think what am i going to get out of this you know yeah it's great to get something out of this but the bible exhorts us to consider one another we ought to be thinking about how we can be a blessing to others not just how we are going to be blessed and you know how you're going to be a blessing to others you need to be in the house of god you need to be part of the local church not forsaking the assembling of yourselves together so that you can actually consider and actually practically bless one another by being together not forsaking the assembling of ourselves together as the manner of some is but exhorting one another and so much the more as you see the day approaching verse 26 so hopefully this is building up how you're understanding these passages and you'll start to understand how you would explain these in hebrews 10. for if we sin willfully so this is where again like we would like people misunderstand that there are different applications to sanctifying sin can refer to different things right so the question is when it says if we sin willfully what is the sin that is being committed here that will risk you coming under the judgment of god you know is it fornication is it all these other things you know, murder and theft and all these things well, well no what it's referring to here in hebrews 10 in order for you to sin willfully it's referring to the sin of unbelief and if we compare this to hebrews 3 which we already covered in a previous week we can see here that sin is likened to unbelief or unbelief is likened to a sin in hebrews 3 but with whom was he grieved 40 years was it not with them that had sinned whose carcasses fell in the wilderness and to whom swear he that they should not enter into his rest but to them that believe not so you see the sin that you do willfully after you understand and you hear about jesus christ is that if you do not accept it if you do not believe if you do not enter into the holiest by faith so we see that they could not enter in because of unbelief see it's not their righteousness that stopped them from getting in it's not their lack of continuing to do good works once they were saved that stopped them from going in it was their lack of faith right they did not believe so they were not able to enter into the holiest of all. once you enter into the holiest of all you're saved forever right because you have a high priest interceding for you the blood of jesus christ sanctifying you eternally once you receive that grace for if we sin will be so what is that sin it's referring to the sin of unbelief right if you know about jesus christ you receive the knowledge of the truth this isn't necessarily referring to salvation because people that are not saved also can receive the knowledge of the truth right they can taste of the heavenly gift they can understand salvation but do they believe it no because if they sin willfully right if they reject that grace after they receive the knowledge of the truth there remaineth no more sacrifice for sins he's saying there's no other way for your sins to be forgiven if you reject the grace of god by faith but a certain fearful looking for of judgment and fiery indignation which shall devour the adversaries now what's interesting about people using a passage like this to teach that you can lose your salvation is they never use it consistently it's like people that use passages to teach work salvation and they never apply it consistently uh, if you listen to that that, dis that debate i had with james ledwick about you know one saved always saved um, at one point in the discussion he went to a passage that said you know whosoever abideth in him sinneth not and he was saying well you know if you if you're saved you're not going to you're, you're abiding in him but then i said to him but but the bible says if you abide in him you sinneth not so but you sin so how are you abiding in him so you see how they take a passage to try and teach work salvation but then when you actually apply it to them 
They, they can't actually keep what they're trying to expound. They, they're saying, okay, well, you have to abide in Jesus, which means you don't sin in order to be saved. But if you sin, then therefore you're not even saved by your own standard. You know? So it's the same here. Like generally, when they t use a passage like this to teach that you can lose your salvation, they don't actually apply it consistently. Because what Hebrews is saying that if you get that close, like, because this is really in line with Hebrews 6, right, where you taste of them, you're like right there. You're like, it's like you're right before the veil of that tabernacle and you're about to enter in. Because obviously there are people that may not even got there yet, you know. Um, so I don't exactly know how that all works. You know, is it when people hear about the knowledge of the truth, that's when that blood sanctifies them? Because they, they hear about it now. They realize, oh, wow, I can actually be saved completely by this sacrifice. You know, is that what it means to be perfected as pertaining to the conscience? So there are people that don't really know about it. So they, they're not like in the tabernacle doing that sacrifice. They're not standing right before the door and realizing that they've been sanctified and washed and then just going, no, I'm not going to enter in. Right? That's what it's referring to in Hebrews. That's why when they finally reject it, it's like, well, that's it for them. You know, because God, God's saying, hey, you basically are crucifying the Son of God afresh, afresh in Hebrews 6. So this certain fearful of judgment is like when it says in Hebrews 6, it's impossible for them to be renewed again unto repentance. Now, I don't know any conditional security believer that teaches once you lose your salvation, you can never be saved again. You know, everybody, most people that believe you can lose your salvation, believe you can gain it again, right? It's because you'll lose it, and then if you, I, I, don't even, I don't even know how this works, honestly. So you, you gain it by grace, and then you lose it for not doing good works, but then you only did the good works because you were saved. So you lost it, and then what, do you get saved by grace again? So you get saved by grace, but then the new man can't keep you saved. Because if you don't hold fast to the faith. So, so it must be your flesh that makes you lose salvation. So you, your flesh makes you lose salvation, but your flesh can't make you gain salvation. You gain it by grace, but you lose it by the flesh. And you gain it by grace, and then you lose it by the flesh. I mean, to me, that's what it ultimately comes down to. And that's why Paul says, Are you so foolish, having begun in the Spirit? Are you now made perfect by the flesh? You know, he's saying, like, you, you, made, you, you got saved by grace through the Spirit, and now your flesh, you, you, ultimately, your flesh is keeping you saved because your flesh is the one that's causing you to sin. So you have to try and stop your flesh from sinning in order to stay saved because if your Spirit's keeping you saved, your Spirit's always going to keep you saved because your Spirit doesn't sin. So you can only lose salvation if you're depending on the flesh to keep you saved, to not sin, to hold fast to the faith, so you lose it by the flesh. But they don't believe that. They don't believe that once you lose salvation, then that's it for you. But that's what Hebrews 6 teaches. Hebrews 6 teaches, if they're going to use that passage to say somebody's losing salvation, this is also saying once they lose salvation, you're done. Right? There's a certain fearful looking for a fire, judgment and fiery indignation which shall devour the adversaries. Now when you realize the analogy that's being used in Hebrews 10, it's, it's really cool because you start to see all these passages that he's actually alluding to. So this fiery indignation, which shall devour the adversaries, is actually referring to Leviticus 10, when Nadab and Abihu, the sons of Aaron, took either of them his censer and put fire therein. So remember, these were part of the priests that were sanctified and washed, right? But because they didn't keep the covenant right in the Old Testament, they offered strange fire and put incense or offered strange fire before the Lord, which he commanded them not. Look, and they went out fire from the Lord and devoured them and they died before the Lord. So you see here that they were sanctified, they were washed. No, if, 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 I don't know if, if Jeremiah is making too much noise, just calm him down and bring him back in. And they went out fire from the Lord and devoured them and they, did, and they died before the Lord. So that's what it's referring to here, right? This strange fire before the... Uh, sorry, this, uh, this fiery indignation. That's that fire that came out from the Lord and devoured Nadab and Abihu, being a picture, obviously, of the hellfire that people will burn from if they do not keep the covenant. So notice that the, those priests, Aaron's sons, they were sanctified. They were washed. They didn't keep that Old Testament covenant by offering the right way and then God killed them. 
right? God, uh, God sent out that fiery indignation. He that despised Moses, Lord, died without mercy under two or three witnesses. So what is that referring to? That's referring to the old covenant where you had the death penalty, right? At the mouth of two or three witnesses. At the mouth of two or three witnesses shall he that is worthy of death be put to death. But at the mouth of one witness he shall not be put to death. So just saying here that there is an unmerciful judgment to people that reject the mercy of God. If you reject the mercy of God, reject the grace of God through faith, then it's like without mercy you died under two or three witnesses for people that committed a capital punishment crime. And just like Nadab and Abihu, without mercy they were devoured by the fire for offering strange fire. So he's saying, just like in the Old Testament, there was a certain looking for of judgment when you despised Moses' law or you did not keep the right covenant to enter into that holiest, of how much sore a punishment, suppose ye shall he be thought worthy, who hath trodden underfoot the Son of God, counted the blood of the covenant wherewith he was sanctified an unholy thing, and hath done despite unto the Spirit of grace. So remember in verse 26 where it says, if we sin willfully. Well now, this is why we understand why is it a sin to, to reject the grace of God? Because when you, when you sin willfully by not believing and rejecting the grace of God, what are you in effect doing? You are trotting underfoot the Son of God, you're counting the blood of the covenant wherewith you are sanctified an unholy thing, and you're doing despite unto the Spirit of grace. But notice how what you're doing and what you're being judged for, none of these are like, you know, it's not saying well, because you fornicated, because you quit church, because you stopped reading your Bible, because you started, started taking drugs. No, that's not, that's not what's making you look for that fiery judgment. What's making you look for that fiery judgment is because you rejected the Son. Right? You rejected the grace. You did despite unto the Spirit of grace. You see, that's what they're sinning willfully. Now what's interesting here, these three aspects, trotting underfoot the Son of God, the blood of the covenant, the spirit of grace, this lines up with 1 John 5. Right? This is he that came by water and blood, even Jesus Christ, not by water and blood only. So if you remember, the water referring to his flesh, the blood referring to him being a real man. But it says here, there are three that bear, bear witness in earth, the spirit, it's the spirit of God, and the water and the blood. So there are three witnesses on earth saying Jesus Christ is the Son of God, you know, and that you need to be saved by him. And it's interesting that, I just think it's interesting that these are the three witnesses in earth and that's what you're rejecting in Hebrews 10, right? You're rejecting the Son of God, which is he that came by water. You're rejecting the blood of the covenant wherewith you're sanctified, the blood that testifies on earth. And you've done despite unto the Spirit of grace. That's the last thing that testifies on earth, right? So I thought that inter interesting that it sort of touches on those three earthly witnesses when you reject salvation through Jesus Christ. For we know him that hath said, Vengeance belongeth unto me. I will recompense, saith the Lord. Um, I will recompense, saith the Lord. And uh, where is it? Saith the Lord. And again, the Lord shall judge his people, it is a fearful thing to fall into the hands of the living God. I just wanted to mention here, oh, this is why I was here, yeah, wherewith he was sanctified. So now you understand, because this, this is that other, remember we talked about that other passage in Hebrews, he's perfected forever them that are sanctified, and people get confused because they're saying, well, that's talking about people that are saved, so if we're sanctified. No, no, because sanctified happens prior to salvation in regards to the salvation process. Now you can understand where he says wherewith he was sanctified, an unholy thing. And they're saying, you see here, it's definitely talking about somebody that's saved because it's saying you rejected the blood of the covenant wherewith he was sanctified. But now you can see, well, being sanctified by the blood doesn't necessarily mean you're saved. It's just that the, the blood that prepped you in order to receive salvation, you have now uh, counted it as an unholy thing because you, you, you didn't actually go into the... Uh, the holiest of all, in order to receive that salvation. Now, why do I think this judgment, the fiery indignation, is talking about hell and it's not just a chastisement from God? Well, one thing is, when we are chastised by God, it's not done out of hatred. You know, God doesn't chastise us 
because he hates us, right? And we see this in Hebrews 12, when the chastening of the Lord, it's whom the Lord loveth, he chasteneth, and scourgeth every son whom he receiveth. So if we are chastened of, the God, uh, chastened of God by love, how can it be described as a fiery indignation? Indignation is like a hatred towards somebody, right? So that's one reason why that I don't accept it's a chastening. The other reason why is when we look at here, this vengeance belongeth unto me, I will recompense, saith the Lord. The Lord shall judge his people. These are actually quotes from the Old Testament. Right? So when it says vengeance belongeth unto me, the Lord shall judge his people, he is actually quoting a song in Deuteronomy 32. And this is where people will say, well, what the Lord is judging his people. Isn't this saved individuals? Well, no, because this is a quote in the Old Testament talking about the nation of Israel breaking the covenant, and if they did, they would, you know, they would be sent to hell. That was the cursing of the Old Testament. It's the new covenant that is you know, uh, salvation by grace. So it's a quote, right? It's not a statement. So if we go back to the quote and look at the story, you'll see it's very hard to accept that this Deuteronomy 32 passage is referring to, you know... Um, uh, his people as, as in regards to saved people right and when the Lord saw it now what's interesting about Deuteronomy 32 if you didn't know Deuteronomy 32 the, the first major portion of Deuteronomy 32 is actually a song so notice in Hebrews a lot of the Psalms are being quoted about Jesus you know obviously you've got one in you got a quote from Jeremiah you got a quote from 2nd Samuel as well in terms of prophecies about the Son but a lot of the pro, a lot of the Old Testament quotes in Hebrews are actually being quoted from the Psalms and a song. And I just thought it interesting that this was also a song, even though it wasn't one of the Psalms. It was one of the songs that the nation of Israel sung. And you'll notice because in Deuteronomy 31 at the end, it tells us that this is a song that Moses uh, wrote in order for the people of Israel to sing. So here's some verses in the in this song. When the Lord saw it, he abhorred them. What is it? abhor? To abhor is to hate. Because of the provoking of his sons and of his daughters. And he said, I will hide my face from them. I will see what their end shall be. For they are a very froward generation. Children, look at this. In whom is no faith. Right? So not only is he hating them, but he's saying, hey, these children, talking about the physical children of Israel, have no faith. Not the ch children of God, as in, you know, the spiritual children of God in the New Testament. They have moved me to jealousy that, um, with that which is not God. They have provoked me to anger. This is referring to their idolatry, right? With their vanities. I will move them to jealousy with those which are not a people. I will provoke them to anger with a foolish nation. So this is the fact that there will one day be a true nation that is going to believe on Jesus Christ. For a fire is kindled in mine anger... Look at this. And shall burn unto the lowest hell. So notice how he is quoting a passage in the Old Testament. And the Old Testament passage is talking about judging the nation of Israel, his people, with hell, with his hatred and his indignation. Shall consume the earth with their increase and set on fire the foundations of the mountains. I will heap mischiefs upon them. I will spend my arrows upon them. Notice that the, the death and the killing that is going on here. They shall be burnt with hunger and devoured with burning heat. Remember, the de devour the adversaries with bitter destruction. I will send the teeth of beasts upon them with the poison of serpents of the dust. Does this look like a loving chastisement? No, no. This is the fiery indignation and judgment and wrath of God. The sword without and terror within shall destroy both the young man and the virgin, the suckling also with the gray man, with the man of gray hairs. I said I would scatter them into the corners. I would make the remembrance of them to cease from among men. Were it not that I feared the wrath of the enemy, lest their adversaries should behave themselves strangely, and lest they should say, Our hand is high, and the Lord hath not done all this. For they are a nation void of counsel, neither is there any understanding in them. Oh, that they were wise, that they understood this, that they would consider their latter end, how should one chase a thousand or two put ten thousand to flight except their rock had sold them and the lord had shut them up for their rock is not 
as our rock, even our enemies themselves being judges. For their vine is the vine of Sodom and the fields of Gomorrah. Their grapes are grapes of gall, their clusters are bitter. Their wine is the poison of dragons and the cruel venom of asps. Is not this laid up in store with me and sealed up among my treasures? Look at this. To me belongeth vengeance and recompense. Their foot shall slide in due time, for the day of their calamity is at hand, and the things that shall come upon them make haste, for the Lord shall judge his people. So you see there, is that a chastisement of God on believers? No, this is the judgment of God on Israel for breaking the covenant. That's what's being likened to in the book of Hebrews, as if you reject the new covenant, you will face the judgment and fiery indignation of God. And repent himself for his servants when he seeth that their power is gone and there is none shut up or left. And he shall say, Where are their gods? Their rock in whom they trusted, which did eat the fat of their sacrifices and drank the wine of their drink offerings. Let them rise up and help you and be your protection. See, now that I, even I, I am he and there is no God with me, I kill and I make alive, I wound and I heal. Neither, look at this, neither is there any that can deliver out of my hand see so that's why in hebrews it says it's a fearful thing to fall into the hand of the living god for i lift up my hand to heaven and say i live forever if i wet my glittering sword and my hand take hold on judgment i will render vengeance to my enemies remember the adversaries and will reward them that hate me i will make my arrows drunk with blood and my sword shall devour flesh and that with the blood of the slain and of the captives from the beginning of revenges upon the enemy. Rejoice, O ye nations. So this now, I believe, is a reference to the new covenant. Because O ye nations is now referring to the Gentiles, right? Rejoice, O ye nations, with his people. So I think this verse now is referring to the new covenant, where there is a remnant of Israel which will be together with the nations. He will avenge the blood of his servants and will render vengeance to adversaries, saying, don't worry, God will take judgment onto the ungodly and will be merciful unto, this, unto his land and to his people. So there, that's, I believe, the allusion to the new covenant for those that believe God as opposed to that, those that do not have faith. All right, let's just touch on the last couple of verses in Hebrews quickly. And then I uh, will finish there. So Hebrews 10. So now you understand he's exhorting them to believe, right? He's likening them to believing by entering into the rest, entering into the holiest, being able to approach the mountain. And that's what it's referring to, that not to sin willfully, not to not believe. But he wants them to have assurance of their salvation, but he also wants them to do good. Right? And this is where now he's like exhorting them to think about the rewards that come along with salvation and for them to also continue in good works. He says, But call to remembrance the former days in which after you were illuminated, you endured a great fight of afflictions. Why? Because these professing Hebrew Christians that he wants to make sure that they're saved, they did suffer persecution, right? Because part of, you know, being saved is suffering persecution. So it's, 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 uh, it's expected. Partly whilst you were made a gazing stock, both by reproaches and afflictions, basically they were mocked, right? Made fun of. Partly whilst you became companions of them that were so used. So not only you that he's writing to, but also others that profess Jesus Christ also suffered tribulation. And we see that in other epistles of Paul, in Philippians and whatnot, where he's saying to them, hey, be strong through this tribulation. Even in Corinthians, where he says the God of all comfort is going to comfort through you through your tribulation. For he had compassion of me in my bonds, and took joyfully the spoiling of your goods, right? So they were willing to give to the ministry, knowing that in yourselves, that you have in heaven, a better and an enduring substance. So now he's saying, yeah, cast not away, therefore, your confidence. So he's just, just again exhorting them, make sure you believe, don't cast it away. What is he saying here? Which hath great recompense of reward. Well, it's going to be worth it. So he's saying to them, yes, 
when you believe, you will be suffering persecution and you need the patience to endure it. So don't cast it away. Make sure you do believe that you actually believe what you profess because you're going to suffer persecution for it. But he's saying, don't worry, it's going to be worth it. There's a great recompense of reward. For you have need of patience. Why do you have need of patience? Because it's given to you on behalf of Christ, not only to believe, but also to suffer for his sake. You have need of patience that after you've done the will of God, you might receive the promise. For yet a little while, and he, he that shall come will come and will not tarry. Now, so now I think he then goes on to a different, now he's consoling those that do believe, even if they don't live right, right? He's saying, now the just shall live by faith, so that we know we're saved by grace through faith. He says, but if any man draw back, my soul shall have no pleasure in him. So this is a, I believe this is a quote from somewhere. But he's saying here, he's not saying here, that if any man draw back of the people of the just that live by faith, that you are then going to be judged by God. He's just saying God's not going to be pleased with you. So there's a difference between God's fiery indignation coming on you and just God not being pleased with you not having that patience, right, to go through the trials and tribulations. He says, my soul shall have no pleasure in him, but we are not of them. Who's the we, we, we that actually live by faith, that actually believe and are saved? We are not of them who draw back unto perdition. So if the just lives by faith, if you draw back, you're not going to please God, but you're not going to draw back into perdition. Right? You're not going to lose your salvation. But of them that believe to the saving of the soul. So that's what he ends with. He ends with a consolation of them. Hey, even if you don't go through those trials and tribulations perfectly, Hey, you're not going to necessarily please God, but you're not going to draw back into perdition. Why? Because the just lives by faith. If you believe, you will believe to the saving of the soul. So I hope that makes sense to you. And that also, we'll, we'll, next week, we're going to finish off Hebrews 11 to 12. Go through those a bit more quickly, just because there's some practical applications in there. Also, some good stories from the Old Testament. And then that will finish us in Hebrews. Let's pray. Thank you, Lord, for, uh, thank you, Lord, for your word. I pray that you help us to understand the book of Hebrews. And I uh, just thank you, Lord, that we can uh, look at different references all over the Bible and uh, get a good understanding of what is being taught in Hebrews. Thank you, Lord, that you know, even if we falter in our walk with you, we may not necessarily be pleasing, but we won't draw back to perdition. We, we believe to the saving of the soul. So even if we, all our works are burnt up, we ourselves will always be saved if we have faith, if we hold fast to that profession. So we thank you, Lord, for salvation by grace. We thank you for Jesus Christ. And we thank you that through him, we are able to come boldly unto the throne of grace and find mercy and grace to help in time of need. And we pray these things in his glorious name. Amen.